you know how many times my parents have bailed me out for time after time after time after time of crap that I've done or or mess that I've gotten into so many times they bailed me out. And he said, maybe I'm your miracle. And I looked down at his hand and he had that check written for forty five hundred dollars and it, it was going to get me caught up and then get I think that that was going to get me to the end of my lease and then I could get out of my lease. I think that was going to be the end of it. And I took that check and it's never left my mind. Maybe I'm your miracle. I'm Christy Code Red, and you're listening to Rebel Weight Loss and Lifestyle, where we believe food holds the power to heal or poison, and we believe our society has been misled regarding proper nutrition and weight loss. You're in the right place if you're looking for some straight up truth, because I'm here to shed light on the lies and brainwashing that has taken place over the past five decades. Thanks so much for listening. Welcome back to another episode of Rebel Weight Loss and Lifestyle. I'm your host, Christy Code Red, author, entrepreneur, retired professional boxer. Yeah, this is a solo podcast. I need to do these once in a while because I'm the actual owner of Rebel Weight Loss and Lifestyle. And this is, I don't, I, this is my podcast. I do this, you know, I pay the bills and it's supposed to just be mine. I just rope Carrie into doing it with me because it's so much easier to do with her. It's half the work for me, but once in a while, I've got to get on here and do one myself. So I remember how to do it. (laughs) I'm really happy that you joined us. Of course, um, always, please, if you get a chance, drop a review, drop a rating, uh, you know, uh, share this podcast with someone that you think needs to hear it. It's always better if you can share this rather than trying to tell them what you think, you know, let us do the talking, let me do the talking for you. Um, and it's awkward when you, when you need to talk to somebody about their weight or their lifestyle and you know, it, it, or their, their lifestyle in other areas. And, uh, it's kind of, you don't know how to broach that conversation. Well, why don't you just send them an episode you think that they would like, and hopefully they'll get on that train of of listening to rebel white, uh, of listening to rebel weight loss and lifestyle. So, All right, let's dive right in. We're talking about miracles today. Um, And we're talking about maybe you are the miracle. I'm not really, at the time I'm recording this right now, I'm not really sure what I'm going to name it here, but um, it's based around miracles. And we're going to talk about God in this podcast. So if I have any people who just are completely just against God, and I'm not talking about religion, that has nothing to do with religion. You'll never hear me bring up religion unless I'm talking about the way I was raised. I was raised a very strict religious household, uh, but I don't believe in that now. It's not about religion to me. It's about relationship. Jesus loves me and I love Jesus. Uh, I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and that he's coming back someday. Uh, Jesus doesn't love me any, he'll never love me any more than he loves me right now. There's nothing that can, I can ever do that'll separate me from the love of Christ. That's the bottom line has nothing to do with rules and regulations and, and, and what church building and what kind of music, it doesn't matter. That just doesn't matter. It's all the condition of your heart. And that's, I'm going to talk about that. Cause that's, that's what this story is about. Uh, what happened to me And the miracle that I was praying for that didn't happen the way that I thought it was going to happen. It's really kind of funny when we pray for miracles, sometimes things, things just don't quite go the way we have it carved out in our mind, but let's back up, let's back up, back up, back up, back up, back, 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 back. Uh, uh, let me get my year. Okay. So 2002, I started boxing. I boxed from 2002 to 2010. And uh, I had 15 pro fights over the course of almost eight years. Um, I had two world title fights. I had uh, 15 pro fights, five knockouts. I'd never been knocked out or knocked down. I sure have lost fights. I mean, you, you really can't. It, losing is not a big deal in boxing. I mean, it, 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 it's, they're all good fights. I judge my fights of did I, did I fight my best? Like, for example, the girl I fought in Costa Rica, Hannah Gabriel. Hannah was a great fighter. She was a great fighter. She was a better fighter that night. She beat me fair and square. You know, uh, there are a couple of fights I've lost. I just didn't come into the game on top of my game. 
and I deserve to lose. So uh, my boxing career brought on a lot of great opportunities. And one of them was the fact that I had my own show on MTV. This was called MTV's Made. And this was back in the day where they would make people into things they wanted to become. But what they made these high school students into was completely opposite of what they were currently. And that's what made for great viewing. So what they would do is they'd bring on a coach, someone who is an expert in that area to coach this high school student into becoming something that was completely unrealistic for them to actually achieve. If you think about it. And again, that's what made for good viewing. MTV made MTV's MTV's made was very, uh, very popular and a great show. Great show. I mean, some of them were better than others, but um, I got back from Beijing fighting my world title fight in Beijing. And I got a, a call from MTV. The producers at MTV, um, they heard about me. They know that <laughs> in boxing, we all know that that it's all about the show, right? It's all about the, um, yeah, it's about, you know, it's 50% how well you fight, 50% how well you market. How, how fun are you to watch for boxing? Nobody wants to see two ugly chicks that look like dudes go at it. Sex sells in boxing like it does in anything else. And there's no wonder why some girls wore makeup in the ring. The, there are some fierce, fierce fighters out there and they know it's about the marketing. It's how many butts can you get in the seats? And so MTV had heard about me because I was so marketable and I was, I was so flamboyant and, and out there and fun and, uh, you know, had a great sense of humor and I spoke well to the press and I had been on TV a lot at that point, lots of press, lots of great opportunities, um, to, to be in the spotlight and to show that I was very capable of presenting myself in a professional way. So MTV was looking for a boxing coach. I did still have to audition against hundreds of boxing coaches from all over the country. I sent in my audition tape. And yes, by the way, back in the day, it was a VCR tape. Ain't none of you guys know nothing about the VCR. Well, some of my people do. You guys remember the VCR, be kind, rewind. Remember the VCR tape? That was like with the big camcorder on your shoulder and it would videotape you. I had to send an audition tape to MTV, but they had handpicked me uh, and asked me to audition. Christy, could you please audition? Anyway, I got the role as this girl's trainer and this girl's boxing coach. And the girl that they selected was her name was Jasmine and she was out of Tampa, Florida. And I was living in Augusta, Georgia at the time. And so for six weeks, I had to take this girl who was lazy, who was not driven, who was overweight, who was just a mouthy girl. I just, I didn't like her at all. And I actually had to turn her into a boxer and put her in a real fight. And I only had six weeks to do it. And I met this girl and I just was like, you gotta be, I mean, you gotta be kidding me. Are you kidding me? I can't do this. I mean, I'll be the laughing stock of the boxing and, and boxing is very con connected. There are only 2000 female fighters in the world, maybe even less. Now that was what it was back in the day. We all fought each other and we all fought different weight classes because there were just one or enough girls to fight. So I knew I was going to be laughed at in the industry. If I were to it just, was, it was the, Boxing would look at this as a complete joke, but the boxing industry also knows you need to have press in order to, you can't put butts in the seats if people don't know who you are. So it was good. It was good. You know, it was a little bit of a joke as far as in the boxing industry, you know, but they understood that I, it was needed. You know, you have to have, you have to have recognition. You have to have, um, press, you need to have airtime, uh, to bring, to bring recognition to whatever sport you're doing. So, um, I flew back and forth every week to Tampa, Florida from Georgia. And I trained this girl. She came to Georgia for a couple of filming sessions. I mostly went to Tampa. Um, and we, I trained this girl to box in a real fight. They only gave me six weeks. And by the way, for those of you guys who are so like, I want to be famous. I want to be famous. Like I want to have my own reality show. What you see on TV is not the truth. It's not how you think it is. 
Um, now I am happy to report that what, what you saw on my MTV show, by the way, is very hard to get in touch with my MTV show. Um, they MTV is very, they have that thing on lockdown. I have it on YouTube, my MTV show on YouTube, my episode, but, uh, YouTube, they are like the copyright. They have that thing locked down like crazy. So it's really hard to get in touch. I think I have one CD left of my boxing show. But if you try to put it out on social media and stuff, MTV shuts that down real quick. I don't know why they're so weird about it. So people ask me all the time, I want to watch your MTV show and I can't, I can't show it in public. It's the craziest thing. So, um, we filmed like those of you guys who are, are so enamored with reality shows. I'm, I was getting ready to say, I'm really happy to report that what they did show was what really happened on my show. And I, and a couple of the producers, a couple of times producers wanted me to, um, to fake a certain fake, a couple of different scenes. And I just wouldn't do it. I was like, no, no, my reputation is too precious. I need to, I need to do this the right way. We need to do this the right way, you know? And it wasn't quite edited. The show wasn't edited like the way I would have done it, but I'm not a TV producer. So who cares? The, the show was a huge hit. We were number one highest rated MTV show. We were the season premiere. And immediately I got a call to go to New York City. I was in a, a toxic relationship with my boxing coach at the time, Tom. I think that you guys have heard me talk about Tom. Um, and, uh, he, you know, he was a good coach, but he was a, a very uh, abusive man and toxic and um, extremely manipulative. And so I was looking for a way out. I didn't want to be in that situation anymore. And so when I got a call from, uh, from Martin snow, who owned the Trinity boxing club downtown in the financial district of New York city. And he said, <laughs> any of you guys know Martin snow, he talks like this, yo kid, yo kid. I want you to come to New York and I want you to train at my gym. And so he owned a celebrity boxing gym in the financial district um, uh, in New York City. It's not there anymore. A lot of things aren't there anymore. And so I was like New York City, but I didn't care. You know, I sold my car. I had a I had a, a beautiful Lexus and I sold it so I could have some money. And I took that money and I rented a car. I packed just my clothes and a few, anything I could pack in the car. And I drove to New York. And, um, let me tell you, New York city is not like the sex in the city sitcom or the sex in the city movie. Any of the movies you see, any of the sitcoms you see, any of that stuff where you see these girls and they're wearing these designer clothing guys, it is Oh my Lord. That is so not true. And the people that I did meet that were trying to keep up with the whole New York high society, they were in debt massively over their head, trying to keep up credit card debt, trying to keep up with all the fashion and the styles and the nightlife and everything that everybody did. And it's so sad when you think about what these people sacrifice, they sacrifice their credit. You know, I can, I know that there are like, like people that I met, they were it working retail, working in a, in a store in a high end fashion store, and they're just getting paid an hourly wage, but they're working for some high end, um, you know, designer and they're not making, and it is, it's like, it's all flashy and it's real exciting that people think they're making a lot of money. They're not, they're not, they're sleeping. They're sharing a room with six roommates and sharing a bathroom and sleeping on a small twin bed and just barely getting by. That is New York city. So at the time, remember, this is 2005. I, it was very difficult to find an apartment in New York City. A lot has changed. It's very different now in 2022. But at two, in 2005, I mean, it was, um, it was really hard to get an apartment. Anyway, I found an apartment. I moved in. At first, I had to sleep on someone's couch, you know, um, and I had to, I had to, you know, I share, I did, I did the shared apartment thing where I was one of six girls. And finally I found my apartment. I had barely enough money for a down payment. And I started working for Martin and I'm training celebrities like Cuba Gooding Jr., the singer pink, all kinds of, all, all sorts of celebrities came into our gym and I'm training them pretty soon. I got, I got recruited by a high end gym 
called Peak Performance. It's no longer there as well. Peak Performance NYC, owned by Joe Dowdell, a wonderful man. And um, they recruited me to come and train celebrities at that gym. It was a very, very high end gym and a very secure building. And they trained all the top celebrities like I don't like LL Cool J, like this, like Chris Noth and um, Hillary Swank and um, Ethan Hawke, um, Katie Couric. That was my client. And a lot of a lot of um, top performing athletes at, you know, like the I don't know. I don't I don't follow sports, so I don't know. But I know the couple of the what is the basketball team? The Trailblazers? Is that a basketball team? I don't know. They, the Lakers? I don't know. I'm New York, L.A. I get them all mixed up, but I they were. They were, we always had, we always, we had nothing but celebrities. And then we had, we had authors, we had just like trophy wives in there, you know, that kind of thing, hedge fund managers. So not everybody was high recognizable, like a high, uh, like Julian Michaels, not everybody could recognize everybody, but everybody had money that was there. So I tried to, I started training, uh, high-end clients and I was making, remember 2005, six, seven, eight, and nine, I was making $150 an hour. But keep in mind that my rent was fifteen hundred dollars a month for my for my apartment, and then my gym rent was another two thousand dollars a month, and then I had food, and then I had a dog Champ, and he had to have dog food. So I and I did not eat out, and I did not drink, and I did not spend money frivolously. I remember specifically. I'll rabbit hole for a second. I was invited by a bunch of girls at my church because I found a church called the NYC church or whatever. It was a really great church. And a bunch of girls asked me to, to celebrate New Year's Eve with them. And guys, I had $20. I had a $20 bill. Well, the way that New Yorkers do it, and you might've seen this on the friends episode is they just split everything down the middle. They'll go six friends, go out to eat and they split it six ways. Doesn't matter what you, what you ate. It doesn't matter what you ate, what you drank, nothing. They just split it six ways. And remember that Friends episode where Rachel, Joey, and, and Phoebe were broke? And finally, they just were like, we can't do this. You know, I'm not paying your half when you guys all have money and we don't have money. Same thing that I went through. So I had $20. That's it. And I remember I wanted so bad to be with these girls, but I didn't have, I just, I I only had $20. And that's, even back then, that wasn't a lot of money. So I went, I had water. And I had a side salad. That's all I could afford. And then what I did was I, I'm, I knew that that was, and then I figured I had the whole thing figured out. I had my $20 and I knew with water, just a side salad, plus the tip that I'd be okay to just like with my $20 and I would leave it even though, I mean, come on, $20 for a side salad. That's New York prices, you guys. Plus I knew I didn't want to leave the tip, you know? So what I did was I spent the evening with them. And then right before the bill came, I set my $20 down and I said, guys, I have to go. I have to go let my dog out. I don't remember the exact excuse. And I left because I knew they were going to do that whole bull crap. And everybody was, you know, they were having appetizers and they were having freaking tomahawk steaks and like I seafood. I mean, the, the bill was just through the roof because there were like 12 of us. Well, Yeah. So that was how I did it. I desperately wanted to be with them, but I could not afford it. So I really had no money. Every bit of money that I made went to my gym rent and my, and then I, my actual um, house rent, because even though like the gym did not provide the clients for me, I, they provided the facility, but I had to pay back a portion of what I earned back to the gym. And rightly so that's, that's, that's typical for a personal trainer. I was, I was doing great. I mean, I mean, I still was living paycheck to paycheck. I didn't know when my next, cause I didn't make money unless somebody paid me. Uh, and everything was going fine until, until the market crashed. Yeah. Now different people feel the pain of the market crash of 2007, eight and 2007, 2008 market crash. Everybody kind of feels the pain differently. Um, but for me, I started losing my high-end clients. And this was the beginning of 2009 because I ended up leaving New York the first week of March in 2009. And so the market crashed and I'm starting to lose my clients one by one because what is the first thing someone's going to do 
you know, when they, when they lose their job, they're going to cut out their personal trainer. They're going to cut out their housekeeper. They're going to start making cuts. I mean, it trickles down. That's just how it goes. We all have done that. Uh, and by the way, any, I, I learned a lesson from that, by the way, when, when like during COVID and stuff, when everybody started to cut out everybody in their life, I never, I never cut out any of those people out of my life. Cause I knew I didn't want to be the one that contributing to everybody crashing, you know, my housekeeper, I kept it going at the time, at the time I needed her. I had it. I had a huge, huge house. Now I don't. So I, but anyway, people started losing their jobs and they started cutting out their personal trainer. And I started losing clients like that dropping like flies. I was really getting worried. I had run out of anything I had in savings. I didn't have a lot in savings. I remember standing in the food bank line at one point because I needed food and because I had no food for me and my dog. My mom and dad had overnighted me elk steak to eat. But the problem is you can't have protein without fat. If you just have pure protein, you get what's called rabbit starva starvation. And that was happening to me and my dog. We were eating the, the elk steak, which is very lean, and I had no fat. I needed more variety in my diet, uh, and so did Champ. But I remember I had one meal left and no money, and I gave my last meal to Champ. I mean, it was just really sad story. So this time is going by, weeks are going by, and I am running out of money. And I don't, I mean, all I've got is a credit card and, and, oh, like a credit card, like the discover card. I have this, this bad taste in my mouth, even to this day for discover card. And they didn't do anything wrong. They have their policies, but I had to keep putting things on a credit card and I had, oh, I had no way of paying it back. I had student loans. It was just, I was a mess, but I not, not because of poor spending habits, just because I I ran out of money. I didn't have any money coming in. I even tried, oh, I even um, started bartending and waiting tables on the side, trying to make ends meet. So um, I, want, I needed to leave New York. I had lost all my clients and I had no money left. I needed to leave New York. I had to go back home to Idaho. I had no place to go. And, but I was still locked into my lease. And I lived at 100th and West Broadway up on the Upper West Side. And, you know, before I started recording, I Googled because I wanted to pull up some pictures to show you guys my building. It was a beautiful building. And I lived down in the basement in the uh, Jan, like the superintendent's uh, apartment that there were two superintendent apartments, apartment A and B. Uh, everybody else had numbers, but you knew A and B was the basement, but we only had one superintendent of the building. So he lived in A and B. I lived in A and I tried to pull up, pull open some pictures of the building so I can show you guys where I lived. Um, but it's all changed so much in the last 15 years, you know, I'm 18, whatever. How, oh my gosh. How long has it been? Nine, 2009, 2019. Yeah. I'm 15 years or something like that. So I didn't have anything else, but I lived right across from the Seinfeld cafe. You guys remember the old Seinfeld sitcom and yeah, like where it says diner on the outside. I lived right across the street from that. It was so cool. I never did go in there because I didn't have any money to eat out. But so um, I was still locked into my lease and I went into the leasing office and this was back then, guys, they're very different now. Back then I went into the leasing office and I said, Hey, and I was crying. And I said, I have, I lost all my clients. I don't have any jobs. I can't, nobody, nobody's hiring right now. I have no way of making money. I have to leave New York. Would you please let me out of my lease? And they, they were so mean to me and they were rude. Like they just, they, they couldn't at least just say, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Our hands are tied. There's nothing we can do. I'm sorry. This is a legal document and just be kind about it. But they were nasty. They were, they were snotty. They were judgmental. They, they, they talked down to me and I was crying and they just, they were so mean. I'll never forget the way they made me feel. And I was just like, I walked out of there crying. I said, what am I going to do? I ended up subletting my apartment to a couple. It's a great apartment. It was a one bedroom apartment for 1550 a month. That was unheard of. That was so cheap back then. Even back then it was so cheap, beautiful apartment, one bedroom, one bathroom, kitchen, living room. It was awesome. Awesome building. It was just, you know, I had little half windows cause it was a basement, you know? <laughs> so, um, I subletted my apartment to this couple left New York, packed everything up in a U-Haul, drove across the country. Um, I couldn't get a plane ticket and it would have just been just as much. I don't know, from whatever reason, I just took what I owned. I, I loaded it up in a U-Haul and I drove across the country and I left. Well, um, 
I got, I had to move in with my folks. This is March of 2020, uh, 2009. Had to move in with my folks. And just as I, just as I, the, my biggest fear came, came true about a month in these people quit paying their rent. And I got a notice from the agency saying, Hey, your rent hasn't been paid. And of course, then I tried to contact the subletters and say, why haven't you paid your rent? Because you're, you know, we had it arranged to where their payment was going to go right into, and they quit paying, they moved out or they quit paying or something. And I was stuck with this ding on my credit because I couldn't pay the rent and I had no money. I couldn't pay the rent. I was behind. It was awful. And I remember crying, crying out to God. I mean, I remember the exact moment that I got that call that said, Hey, nobody paid your rent and you need to pay it. And I, and I was like, and I think it was two months past due. I think there was like three, it was, I remember it specifically being $4,500 that I needed to pay. So I think it was two months plus past due. So $3,000, maybe it was three months plus due. Cause that would be, that would make sense. $4,500. So they didn't pay, they didn't pay for March, April, May, something like that. And I was three months past due. And if I didn't pay the rent, then that would ding my credit. Plus my parents co-signed for me on that apartment. And that would ding their credit too. And I remember just, oh, like crying out to God with this, like just from the depths of your, of your soul, like I was on my knees and I was just, I, it was, it was one of the worst moments of my life. Cause I just, you know, what really was upsetting was because I had had a ding on my credit from, uh, 1994. And I had already had that taken care of. My credit was, was good. It was being, you know, it was good and it was coming back up. And then now this, and then my parents' credit is going to get dinged because of me. And that was so horrifying. I just, my parents trusted me to co-sign for me. And then now this, and I just remember just crying out to God and saying, please, God, I need a miracle. And I needed a miracle. I needed $4,500. I needed a miracle, a full on miracle. And I was just like, and I believed, I mean, I believed that God could do it. I was just like, I believe. And I, I really, I mean, I had they, the Bible talks about faith of a mustard seed, man. I knew God could do something like I knew that. I don't know. Some stranger would put a $4,500 check in the mail to me or something. I don't know. I don't know how God was going to do it, but I just, and I had it in my mind that God was going to just, I don't know, send a, a check floating down from the sky or a lightning bolt or something would have been a glitch and then the money would have been in there. I just didn't know. So I was standing in my, in my mom and dad's kitchen. You remember I'm back living with my folks. I've got nothing. I mean, I've got less than nothing. I mean, they're feeding me. They're feeding my dog. I've got nothing. I'm teaching boot camp uh, for like $5 a person in my dad's church parking lot. You know, like, I mean, I am really, I'm scrimping. I have no car. I have no money. I have nothing. And I, I just, my dad, we were standing in the kitchen of my dad, mom's house there on buckboard in McCall. And my dad writes out a check and hands it to me. And I said, no. And I'm crying, you know, and I said, no, 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 no. What are you doing? No, no, no. I'm praying for a miracle. This is going to be, God's going to come through for me. It's going to be a miracle. He's going to take care of me, dad. You don't need to do this. God's going to take care of me. I mean, I believed it with every ounce of my soul. And my dad quietly looked at me and he said, maybe I'm your miracle. And he hands me the check. And my mom's standing there and she's just kind of smiling. My folks are just looking at me. Oh my, you know how many times my parents have bailed me out for time after time, after time, after time of crap that I've done or, or mess that I've gotten into so many times they bailed me out. And he said, maybe I'm your miracle. And I looked down at his hand and he had that check written for $4,500 and it, it was going to get me caught up and then get, I think that that was going to get me to the end of my lease. And then I could get out of my lease. I think that was going to be the end of it. And I took that check and it's never left my mind. Maybe I'm your miracle. And just by the way, fast forward many years later, after Code Red starts getting bigger, I did pay it forward to my folks. I bought my dad a brand new truck. I bought my dad two brand new trucks and I bought my mom a brand new car so that they would be debt free going into going into retirement. Um, and I have taken care of my family. I bought my little sister, a brand new car, a Volkswagen Jetta, and I have taken care of my family, um, 
a couple of times. I mean, not not anything drastic. I didn't buy them a house. Um, I didn't have that kind of, you know, I did. I didn't, it didn't come to that, but I have, and then also not to try to impress you just to kind of tell you the story. Uh, my little niece had gotten into an abusive marriage right out of high school, uh, had some dings on her credit report, trying to pay off student loans, uh, had a repossession due to her ex, you know, kind of the same thing you've heard from lots, lots of stories like this. And she was trying to claw her way out of debt. And I wrote, I wrote her a loan for, I think it was $15,000. I wrote a check and I paid off all her loans and she was making payments to me. And I think about a year ago, I forgave her of the rest of that debt because my dad ended up, I was trying to make payments to him and my folks forgave me of that debt. The $4,500 check dollar check that they gave to me to get me caught up on my rent from New York city and get that whole thing uh, taken care of. Uh, I went to go pay that back. And my parents said, you know what? It's okay. And I just like, wow. And I've never, never, never forgotten that. And so when my, my niece was making payments for three or four years to me, I finally said, you know what? Never mind. And I forgave her the rest of that debt because I was forgiven. My parents have taken care of me over and over and over. So I turned around when I was able to, and I took care of them. I would take care of them more if they needed me to. I'm always asking my dad, Hey, like, do you need a, do you need something for hunting? Do you need some new clothes? Do you need some new hunting equipment? Do you need it? Like, what do you need? He doesn't want anything. He doesn't want anything. He never lets me get anything for him. And so let me bring this ball back around. You're like, okay, Christy, what a great story. What the heck does this have to do with anything? My dad said, maybe I'm your miracle. And I think that a lot of times we pray for things that we can do ourselves. We pray for, oh Lord, help, you know, help Mary with, uh, you know, help Mary. She's a single mom with two kids. Help her pay that rent. She needs that rent. Well, no, no, you pay Mary's rent. You pay Mary's rent. Stop asking for the miracle that you could absolutely do. I, I don't ask God for miracles that I know I can do myself. I will ask God for other things. And they'll be big things, things that are just so outrageous that it would have to be a miracle for them to happen. You know, I have asked uh, I've asked God to put me on some big stages with 50,000 people in attendance and God will put me there if he thinks I'm ready. And when it's the time is right, but not before I'm I think that a lot of us ask for miracles that we can do ourselves. We ask for big changes that we can do ourselves. I, I have people that come to me with code red and they say, I've been praying for a miracle with my weight. And then you came along. Okay. Um, oh, I, I see what they're saying, but I think that a lot of people are shoving the Oreos and the washing it down with wine in their down there, down there, down their pie hole. And they are praying for a miracle about their weight. Well, you know, like I, it seems clear to me that the first thing you should do is just stop with the Oreos and the wine. But a lot of people think, well, they're low, that maybe they think that, well, they're low fat Oreos. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know what they're thinking. Some people just don't know. And then some people you're like, why are you paying for playing for praying for a miracle when it's something you can stop doing right now? Are you praying for a miracle that you could take care of right now? Is this something that, you, you can do yourself. And I'm, I'm all for praying for all kinds of things. Pray, pray for everything. I mean, the enemy wants you to think you can't pray for that. So I believe in praying for it, but as far as making it happen, Oh Lord. Oh, one lady said to me one time, I pray I can stay on track today. What I no, we don't, we don't rely on just hope and prayers and wishful thinking. We set ourselves up for success in the code red lifestyle. We set ourselves up for making sure we, ha we, have, we don't have any sugar in the house. We don't have any alcohol in the house. We make sure we don't have any, any sugar hidden in our glove box or our desk drawer at work. We make sure that we're not going to the grocery store hungry, that we don't, uh, you know, you're wanting to, oh Lord, I hope I can stay away from that alcohol. And then you go out to happy hour with your girlfriends. You put yourself in a situation that you can easily cave and then you just pray for the strength to be able to do it. Wait a minute. How about helping yourself by not putting yourself in that situation? Don't make God's job any harder. There are a lot of things you can control. 
And then you pray for the things that you can't. But I, I see people praying for miracles all the time. And there are things that they can take care of themselves. They can they can absolutely do. And I, I find that to be so interesting that we're not interested in helping ourselves. Well, I'm praying for it. That's good. I hear you. But how about we do this in between? Like we do this for the time being. We go ahead and maybe maybe I'm your miracle, I'm saying to you. Maybe Code Red is your miracle. Maybe I am in the position that my dad it was and writing the check to, to bail you out. Maybe I'm bailing you out. I'm bailing you out with this with this program, with this real food, water and sleep. I've got over a thousand videos on YouTube covering every single subject you can imagine. I've got this podcast. Oh, we've got the 10 pound takedown. We've got so many resources for you. I've got my Instagram. I've got my TikToks. I've mean, got so many things to help you stay on track. We've got the Code Red Network that is free to be in. That's free from social media and free from ads and algorithm and drama and all that baloney. We've got so many free resources and yet you're sitting back and praying for a miracle. Maybe this is your miracle, but you've got to swim towards me. You've got to come our way. You've got to take the step. Oh, I'm just, I'm just asking God to come through for me on my weight loss. Mm, no, Karen. No. Uh, you need to quit buying the Keebler elves. That's not a God thing. Quit buying the Keebler elves. Don't buy them and bring them home. Pray for it if you want to, but don't wait for some big booming voice to come down. Use your common sense. It's just like the medical community. How about these zealots, these crazy people who are, they think that like they don't believe in medicine and they, and they just pray for a miracle. God has, or has ordained and has, um, has given this knowledge to these doctors to help you. And yet you won't, you won't get the help because you're praying for a miracle. Maybe that's your miracle. I just listened to a Joyce Meyer episode here recently, and she takes anti-anxiety anti meds. And I don't know what anxiety meds, I don't know what med it is, but she takes anti-anxiety meds. That's what she called them. And people were criticizing her because they said, I can't believe that a powerful woman of God like you takes anti-anxiety meds. Don't you believe in miracles? Don't you believe in healing? She said, 100% I do. But I went through massive incest and massive sexual abuse from her dad and, and physical abuse and um, oh, horrific abuse, things that you can't even imagine from her own father for 15 years. That's going to leave a mark. And so... Our modern medicine has come up with ways to help reduce the anxiety that she still deals with all these years later. You know, she's in her 80s and this, you know, the abuse stopped when she left home at 18 years old. But she's got massive, massive trauma left over from that. Can God deliver her? Yes, God has delivered her, but she's smart enough to use modern medicine as well as exercise, as well as good, solid nutrition, plenty of water, good sleep, no stress. She's covering all her bases and she takes anti-anxiety meds. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I took an antidepressant for a little while. I got really, really sick in 2021. I have shared this with you guys. And my doctor said, you know, Christy, your stress level, my stress level was through the roof. I had multiple organ failure. I was at high risk for a stroke. And my blood pressure was really high because I have a head injury. They were worried about me. I was not recovering. I was had fluid retention everywhere. Uh, my, my kidneys, my liver, my, my body was not processing. And I was shutting down. It was not good. And my doctor suggested that I go on an antidepressant to take the edge off my life. I was having problems with miles. We were having problems in our marriage. You know, that was the beginning of the end. And I did, I did it. I did it for three months. I took, I took an antidepressant. What was it called? Um, Lexapro. I took a Lexapro 
And I, I and I, I, I'm, I don't know what you're going to say about this. I don't know. In addition to eating clean, in addition to, you know, I changed my stress. I brought my stress way down. And the way I operate now is like two different people from a year ago. Maybe that was my miracle. Instead of just praying for a miracle and standing around and waiting, change what you can change. I did, I did get off the antidepressant. Uh, I was only on it for about three months. I know there, that's very, very short to be on an antidepressant. Most people are on it for one to six years, maybe sometimes 15 years. Maybe sometimes you never get off of it. And let me tell you, I have no judgment, no judgment, big fat zero, no judgment on you. I would like to see you also change your diet, start sleeping more, drinking your water, don't get off the alcohol. I got alcohol is poison guys. That's why you don't feel good when you drink it. It's poison. Your body tries to get rid of it. That's what you do when you throw up. That's what you do when you have a hangover, your body's trying to get rid of the poison. So by you covering the basis of what you can control using modern medicine, if you need it, and praying, I think that's good. But maybe Code Red is your miracle the way that my dad was my miracle. And I, when I say my, my dad, by the way, I mean my dad and mom. There was no, my mom and my dad are like, that was, my dad never would have done something without my mom agreeing with it. I just, my dad was the one that was saying it. Mom was standing right next to him when, when this all happened. So mom, I know you're listening. I know it was you. It's both of your money. Maybe Code Red is the miracle that you've been praying for. Maybe Whole30 or Weight Watchers or the Paleo Diet or Mediterranean. I don't care what program you do, but maybe that's the miracle. Maybe God has, I know that God has put me on this planet to do what I am doing. This is what I was created for. I'm doing, I'm living out my purpose and my calling. I have been anointed for what I am doing. And I'm perfectly fine with that. So maybe I'm what, I hate to say I'm, it sounds, it sounds very, um, wrong for me to say, maybe I'm your miracle, (laughs) but maybe code red is your miracle. I like to say it better than that. Better like that. Maybe this is what you've been praying for, but it's going to take some action on your part. It's going to take some action. It's going to take you doing your part, doing what I say, cleaning out the cupboard, going to bed early, turning your phone off, making sure you wear your blue light blocking glasses, making sure you get blackout curtains, making sure you cool down your house. I don't know why I'm having a hard time sleeping because you've got blinking lights coming through your, you're not doing anything I say. Well, I'm just praying that God will help me sleep. And then you've got noise and lights and, and blinking lights and all these devices around you. God can't like, why are you praying for something that you can fix yourself? I don't get that. Be smart. Use what you know. Use the knowledge that I've given you. Be accountable for what you know. Oh, believe me, I have laid I have laid awake some nights. I've done everything right. I've done the blue light blocking glasses, the blackout curtains. My room was 66 degrees. I wore my, oh, I said that, glasses. I had a half a sleeping pill on board. I had taken my mag. I had taken my CBD, my CBD oil, my super sleeper bundle. I had taken everything. I had gone to bed early. I did my deep breathing and my, my monkey mind would not stop going. And I literally prayed, Jesus, please, please put me to sleep. Please help me go to sleep. Please get these thoughts out of my mind. Please. In the name of Jesus, I command peace on me right now in the name of Jesus, because I had done everything right. And it wasn't working. I hadn't had any caffeine. I hadn't eaten. Like, I mean, I was doing everything right. So there are times for, I mean, it's always okay. It's always good to pray, but don't just pray and sit there, pray and move. Pray and do something. Do what you can do. And there's a whole lot you can do. There's a whole lot you can control. Maybe I'm your miracle. Maybe this is what you've been praying for. But let me tell you, you're going to have to take some action. You know, people that pray to get out of debt. Oh, Lord, we've got, you know, $67,000 in credit card debt. And I think that people think that God's going to send a check like I thought you know, floating through the air, like a miraculously, can, can he do it? Of course, God can do anything. But I think the first thing when you're praying for your miracle to get out of debt is quit freaking charging crap on the, ch- on the charge card. Cut up your credit card. Maybe you get a second job. 
Maybe you quit doing Uber Eats. Maybe you start cooking some ground beef patties at home. Do what you can. Can God deliver you from things? Absolutely. He'll do whatever he wants to do. I'm not worried about that. But you got to do what you can do with your finances, with your marriage. You know, if you're having a hard time in your marriage, believe me, I, <laughs> I'm not one to give merit of, marital, marital advice. And I'm just saying, I think everybody will agree. If you're saying, oh, Lord, I can't get a hold. I can't get, I can't get along with my spouse. And you're watching porn all the time. You got a porn problem. I'm looking at the camera. Those of you who guys are watching, I'm not judging you. I'm just saying, yeah, no wonder you can't, you can't get along with you're watching. Don't let that in your life. Maybe you've got marital problems and you're texting your coworker and you shouldn't be. Don't pray for a miracle and then not do anything that you can do. You can do more than what you think. And then by golly, you know, pay it forward. Keep it going. Help other people. I'm so glad I was given the opportunity to buy my folks a car and a truck and my sister, my little sister, a car and help out my niece, get her out of debt and get, and then forgive the rest of her debt. That child, she cried. You guys should have, oh, you guys should have gotten that phone call. My gosh, my, oh, Lord Jesus. I'm, uh, now I'm tearing up here. My niece called me up. She was crying on the phone and I, she had gotten, um, she had gotten my letter in the mail or something. I don't know how I must've written it into a letter. I think I sent her a birthday card or something and um, said, Hey, sissy, you know, Oh, I know what it was. I was holding on to her title. That was the agreement. If I wrote that long for loan for her, I would um, hold on to her title in my safe. And she said, Aunt Christy, can I have my title so I can get it re so I can get it retitled or whatever. And when I sent it to her, I said, you know what? You own this car. And she sent me that. Oh, she called me up. She was crying. I was crying. <laughs> She said, Aunt Christy, you have no idea how much this means to me that you forgave this debt. I mean, this frees me up, blah, blah, blah. You know, I knew she was, I knew she was good for it. That kid paid every month without missing a single payment for years. She proved herself to me. The nice thing about God is we don't have to prove ourselves to him. He loves us no matter what. We don't have to earn it. We don't earn it. I, 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 we can't wrap our brains around the love and the forgiveness that Christ has for us. And I didn't mean this to turn into a sermon. Maybe I'm your miracle. Because I have been given the knowledge to get you healthy. But you got to take that knowledge that I freely give you. And I say, here, here it is. What are you going to do about it now? I hope you enjoyed this episode of Rebel Weight Loss and Lifestyle. Please, please, please join us in our Code Red community. We would love to have you. And I'll see you on the next episode. Take care. Hey, I'm Christy Code Red, and thank you for listening to Rebel Weight Loss and Lifestyle. If you want to stay connected to other rebels like you, join us in our private network. Our Code Red app is a one-stop shop, free from ads, algorithms, and censorship and a place where you can see, listen, and watch everything Code Red. You'll be encouraged, motivated, and fired up to stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Get recipe ideas, tips, tricks, and help from coaches, mentors, and other rebels. You can also purchase products, programs, and coaching all right there in one place. And if you have any trouble navigating the app, we're right there to help you. Go to coderedlifestyle.com forward slash APP to join for free. And I'll see you on the next episode of Rebel Weight Loss and Lifestyle.